Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Shivatsa, Sashi, Anjani, Srishant, Malesh, and Siddharth. Good morning to all. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Good morning, everybody. Morning. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, firstly, for uh, assembling over here. I know you guys are all busy running around and that too on a, uh, on a working day. Thank you very much for agreeing to be here on the panel discussion on low carbon food. This is part of the Climate Fix Summit 2023 Insight Series, where we get experts like you in specific fields online together around specific themes. Uh, the idea is that we have these online panel discussions before Climate Fix Summit instead of having it there. Collect your inputs and then engage you right there for something far more meaningful. So that's the idea. Um, Climate Fix Summit, as you know, it, this is in September 22, 23 this year. We are doing it once again with IIT Madras uh, at the IIT Madras Research Park. So that's the context. The, the idea, as I said, is to get all the insights before the event and use them at the event. And what we have also done is we have realized each of these themes is um, pretty complex. It can take quite some time to discuss. So we have also tried to split the online panel discussion for each theme into two or three. Ambitiously, we are looking at three panel discussions for each of these themes. One is, of course, your theme, low carbon food and agriculture. At least we'll have two. And the first session, which is today for this theme, the idea is to set the context. And once we have done it, the next stage, the next session can be where we can take it to the next stage in terms of recommendations, etc. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So for yeah, today, as I sent a note yesterday um, to you guys, uh, we can have it in maybe two, two, two parts. One, the first part can be where um, each of you can very briefly introduce yourself. Uh, your individual background is equally important, trust me, as well as what your company does. That can be the first part which can be over probably in 15 minutes or so. And the next 30, 40 minutes, I would like you guys to focus on the first part of the, uh, on, on, on the initial stages of the theme, which is what are the challenges in making the market appreciate low carbon food? What are the challenges in making the market pay a premium for low carbon food? We will discuss the challenges alone today. That alone could be quite a lot. And the second session, which probably will be a couple of weeks later, we can probably discuss solutions and way forward. That can be dedicated only to the, the 45 minutes to an hour. We can, even, we can even perhaps take an hour for that. So that's the idea. Quick set of introductions, about 30 minutes, where we discuss the key challenges to low carbon food, especially from a customer appreciation of its value and its premium. Let's start once again. Thank you very much. Um, um, why don't we start maybe with each of you guys giving a short introduction. Let's start with Srivatsa, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, uh, hello everyone and uh, Narsi, thanks again for having me on this uh, panel. It's always a pleasure to be uh, part of the Climate Fix uh, you know, community. Uh, very quickly, um, I'm the, I'm the uh, uh, co-founder and uh, CEO here at Tracex Technologies. My name is Srivatsa Srinivas Rao. I hail from Bangalore. Academically, an electrical engineer uh, graduated back in the year uh, 2000. Uh, yeah, 2000. And uh, shamelessly, I say only thing I know today in electrical engineering is how to change bulbs. Nothing beyond that, <laughs> right? Anyway. Me there, by the way. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So um, I started off my career as a software developer back in 2000. Worked in the corporate IT sector in a couple of, um, uh, you know. Uh, business sectors, including financial services, education, tech, and so on and so forth for 14 years. And uh, after 14 years of um, corporate experience, I uh, jumped into the crazy world of startups uh, back in 2014 uh, as, a, uh, as someone who's responsible for building products for an ed tech startup. Uh, and that, uh, uh, though we couldn't scale it uh, uh, beyond, uh, but I think that was a great uh, introduction for me into the into the world of startups. And that's around the time I went to IIM Bangalore for my executive uh, general management program. So this is my second startup in the agriculture since uh, 2015, first one being uh, uh, Jeeva Bhumi, uh, predominantly food. Uh, uh, food has always been very good and agriculture has been very close to uh, my heart. Uh, Jeeva Bhumi is where we started off uh, uh, addressing the need of safe food for consumers. A lot of learning from there. Uh, we realized that uh, supply chain needs more digital digitalization and more organized and more transparent. 
that led us to uh, sort of discovering ourselves um, uh, into building leveraging digital tools to address the need of traceability. And that's the inception of TraceX back in 2019. Since then, we have been passionately solving for um, a few issues predominantly to do with data in, in the food and agriculture space. Largely, we're in the business of creating credible data sets, credible and transparent data sets uh, in, in, the, in the supply chains focused on food and agriculture, eventually addressing the need of uh, you know, uh, challenges such as food traceability, it could be sustainability, it could be the ability to uh, measure and reduce carbon emissions across the supply chains uh, to help organization accelerate their net zero uh, uh, goals. So we are essentially uh, uh, a blockchain powered uh, digital agriculture as well as a DMRV uh, platform, helping enterprises leverage nature as a, a means to achieve their uh, climate action goals on on the uh, sustainability side, and uh, part of that pro uh, 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 you know uh, product itself is traceability. I'll talk uh, more about it as we move along. I, I pause there and let uh, others uh, introduce. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shivat sir. Uh, just to um, uh, request each of you, since Malaysia needs to move at eleven thirty, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Malaysh last. He can maybe give a brief introduction about himself and also state the key challenges he sees for the particular theme so that once he completes, he can move on, we can move to the next. If each of you can keep your introduction to about two minutes, then I think Malaysia will have about five, five, six minutes. Malaysia, is it okay for you to be here till 11.30? Is that okay? No, that's fine. No problem. Thanks. Perfect. So let's time it like that, uh, Sashi. Sashi, you're muted. Okay, it's as usual. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> with my uh, little background in uh, engineering, spent good amount of time around seventeen years, actually coding, and I came out of uh, um, software thinking that everybody would as a PowerPoint presentations. Actually, they are brain dead. So I always wanted to uh, really <laughs> see that uh, we can get into farming and uh, change farming. But uh, in last 13 years, what has happened is we couldn't change farming. Basically, we have changed ourselves. That's how it is. It's a fairly complex topic we realized. And uh, last 13 years, uh, we have reduced our scope, our ambitions, and uh, we went uh, very deep into farming. 13 years, we have worked with around uh, 1,000 farmers. That's it. And uh, gone uh, very, very deep into agriculture and soil management and also uh, hedging, bunding, okay, tree integration, so diversifying the farm. So various aspects in Akshakalpa, we start with a dairy and integrate back at poultry. So integrate banana, so integrate greens and vegetables. Beekeeping is very important aspects of our journey. So that's how uh, we have been uh, doing small, small steps in these thousand farms. And uh, in last 13 years, we have taken average revenue Okay, per farm, okay, around 100,000 rupees on a monthly basis. So we, all these 1,000 farms are located in 1,000 villages. What we are trying to envisage is, can we create a role model farmer in each village? So that's the, okay, a task we are on. And we don't work on, work with more than one farmer in a village. And we, we hope that in next maybe 10 years, we can add around 1,000 more farmers, around 2,000 villages we can demonstrate that farming is viable, it is profitable, and the consumer okay, is willing to pay for good food. Yeah, that's the introduction. Thank you, thank you, Sashi. Uh, Anjani? Yeah, hi, Narasi. Uh, hi, everyone, great to be here. Uh, I'm always a fan of ClimaFX uh, event, so I'm glad I'm here again. Uh, we are a Japanese VC fund. Uh, I've been with the fund for a year and a half, uh, while we are sector agnostic, fund uh, climate tech, uh, agriculture, and food uh, is an important part of our portfolio, uh, both in India and other countries. Uh, prior to joining the fund, uh, I was at the Gates Foundation and uh, in other roles as well. Uh, I've been investing in agriculture uh, startups uh, for over a decade now, have had the opportunity to invest across the value chain. Uh, so I have seen the space evolve as well, uh, both in India and few other countries. So I'm glad to uh, be part of this discussion. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Thank you, Anjani. Short and sweet. Sushant? 
Uh, yeah, hi everyone. So Shant here. Uh, so I'm currently working with uh, Revex Capital. Uh, this is a new fund we launched just three months ago. Uh, a non dilutive debt fund uh, with a target corpus of 600 crore. Uh, we are sector agnostic. Uh, I personally have been uh, sort of exposed to agri, agri investing uh, uh, for the last seven years now. Uh, and had the fortune uh, fortune of working with many entrepreneurs, seeing them cross the value chain uh, from input processing to market linkage, um, link uh, of the challenges there. I personally have been born and brought up in a small town uh, in Haryana, uh, Punjab, which is primarily an agricultural town. And even my family uh, was involved in agriculture for a very long time. Uh, people moved out uh, and started doing uh, other things. An engineer like Shashi and Shivatsa was mentioning, I, I studied biotechnology and, uh, and then uh, uh, I also uh, was unfortunate to work in software industry for uh, and then before I uh, sort of flipped uh, uh, eight years ago. Uh, yeah, and I mean, topic is very challenging uh, uh, in terms of low carbon food and agree. I've seen the issues related to pricing across uh, the value chain. Uh, happy to learn uh, from the uh, panelists here. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Sushant. Uh, before I go to Siddharth, Sushant, I don't know if the problem is with my network, but there were some gaps in the um, there are some network issues. Why don't you just check let it out? Me, by... Let me move closer to the router a bit. Uh, I'll just possibly, yeah, possibly, uh, because there were some uh, some challenges while you're speaking. Uh, so, uh, Siddharth, we'll go on to you a couple of minutes, and then maybe we can have Malesh introduce himself as well as state the challenges, and then we can continue. Thank you, Siddharth. Yeah, thank you, uh, sir, and uh, I am really honored to be part of Climate Fix from the day it began. And really, it's a journey which has made me also learn a lot of things in the whole process. Uh, so uh, giving a quick brief about what we do at ClearMeet is, uh, speaking of myself, I started my journey in the, in the field of uh, climate revolution or climate uh, sustainability when we were doing a biotechnology setup. So actually, ClearMeet is my second uh, setup, biotech setup, uh, when it comes to doing, uh, bringing lab science to uh, market application. And uh, the, uh, at ClearMeet, we are coming up with a vision of developing ethical and sustainable solutions for the food industry. And when I speak of these sustainable solutions, uh, there were three major pain points that we identified in our routine research. Uh, these three major pain points were that 30% of the, or I should say the agricultural land, only 70% of the land available on earth is uh, available for agriculture. And out of this available land, 30% is utilized by uh, poultry farms or factory farms, which are into making meat. We do not realize in our routine uh, uh, have food habits that we have been a, uh, consuming meat for ages. And if you speak of India only, 70%, so this is recorded numbers, 70% of Indians are pure non-vegetarians. And the demand is huge. Uh, India is the larger exporter of beef, which we never realized. But we make meat at a very large uh, rate. Speaking of this, uh, as this meat industry takes care of or uh, takes charge of 30% of the agricultural land, Utilizing 30% of the available water footprint, it has resulted in becoming uh, the one of the major reasons for uh, global, uh, global warming. This meat industry is responsible for 15% of the global warming. So what we did at ClearMeat is using our in-house expertise of research. So we come from a background of PhD. We are, all, we are a, a team, team members. All my team members are pure PhD scholars who are hardcore psychologists on the lines of understanding the core problems. And we started on working, identifying solutions for this meat industry. Uh, we started looking at the ways meat is made. So the idea was to replace the way meat is made with laboratory uh, or regulated formats. What we eat is not regulated and it has various issues from health to quality to how it is made or how non-sustainable it is. So what we are doing at ClearMeat is we are replacing this whole model system with our lab-grown meat in a controlled environment where we are able to take control and take charge of the CO2 emissions that we do. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth. Uh, 
very nice uh, to have somebody from that sector. So, Malesh, before I go on to you, we have about seven minutes. Let me take 30 seconds. The point really is what we are trying to discuss today so that Malesh can start off and then others can continue. If you look at something like um, uh, uh, renewable energy, it started with 17 rupees per unit for solar and they, it's today two and a half rupees, which means the consumer acceptance is much higher because today, when you compare it to the conventional, the green premium for solar has practically come to zero, which means there is really no premium. Sometimes it's cheaper. That is probably not the case with food and probably for the right reasons because scaling in food, as Sashi said, is a, is a completely different aspect. The question so is, uh, there is going to be a premium, premium attached to low carbon food, low carbon agriculture, but eventually rather than looking at the government to do something about it, it will be great if the consumers, end users start appreciating it better, start paying more so that everybody wins. But what are the status and what are the challenges? Malesh, you can introduce yourself, tell your thoughts, and then I will update you on the rest once this is over. Thank you. Go ahead, Malesh. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to appreciate what you guys are doing because being part of Climate Fix and this panel is helping us actually actually to accelerate our uh, move towards uh, net zero kind of situation, right? I would not use the word net zero in its uh, completeness, but towards that goal. And uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm also an engineer. I don't know. I don't want to call it as unfortunately. I want to, I, I'm really happy. Okay. I'm an engineer because being an engineer is helping me to connect different dots that normally other people may not be able to see. That's how I look at it. I'm engineer by uh, industrial production engineering, but I'm farmer by heart because I enjoy farming that I noticed way back with my childhood. And as I grew, I didn't have the luck to have too much farmland. So once I came back from US, I bought 10 acre farmland to understand what is it to be like a farmer and what are the typical challenges a farmer will have. And is our engineering aspect really addressing those problems at the ground level? And my first interaction after getting a farmland was basically irrigation management was the most misunderstood concept because the consultant and the companies will tell you need to provide X amount of water and there is no way ordinary farmer who don't have any technology access will be able to provide irrigation. So if he's not providing irrigation, how can we expect a crop that is going to be healthy and nutritious? That was my fundamental problem. And if you are able to tackle that, then the next question is, are we able to provide the right nutrition? For me, it's simple. Everybody in the world knows if you are taking right amount of water and right amount of food with right quality and our health is going to be good. That means my spend on the doctor and the medicine and all those things is going to be far less. Plants are alive. It's the same condition. So that's where I started focusing more on that when I was having my own farmland, which started off with 10 acres and went all the way to 70 acres. Then I scaled it down. And once I got enough confidence that I got a handle on this, some of the aspects of agriculture, I said, why don't I try to set up a company that can actually spread it to more and more farmers? I did not do it with the social thing in mind, but I wanted to do it as a business because I believe what, give, what is given to farmers or any consumers as we, they don't see any value. So I said, how can I show a value to my farmers who believes they need to pay a premium or a price to the services that we are going to be providing? And the service is very simple. I will tell you when your crops are asking for water. So that means we have got sensors that are sitting in the ground that talks to the plant in terms of understanding the symptoms. And then they send a message to farmer in simple terms saying that your crops are asking for water. Now, this is the problem that we are trying to solve. Currently, we are working with paddy farmers. Why paddy farmers? Most often, many people may not realize to grow one kg of rice, it takes close to 5,000 liters. And when we are talking about a farmer who is doing farming in the states of Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, he consumes close to 2 crore liters per hectare per season. So in Punjab, they do only one season, that means 2 crore. When you come to Karnataka or Tamil Nadu, they will be doing 2 or 3 crops. So you can imagine it's going to be anywhere between 4 to 5 crores per year per hectare. Now, is that what is required? That's where the important question of what needs to be done is required. And second one, are we having the right infrastructure in place? Because technology alone cannot solve all the problems. Technology can be a tool. And what's important is changing the mindset of the user and the consumer. Both of them are equally important. That's the biggest challenge that we have been having. First one, the, uh, our end user is a farmer. And farmer says, why should I pay money for water which is free? And even if you are trying to convince him, his next question is, why should I adopt your technology because even electricity is free, right? There is no, there is no penalty or there is no fee that he has to pay. 
so that's the biggest challenge we are having so how we are trying to uh, uh, do, do it is we are trying to work with the users in our case we are not trying to uh, uh, i'm sorry not user but the person who is going to get benefited right because farmer is our end user but he is not actually getting benefited so we are trying to find people who are the actual beneficiaries so one of the use case is basically the exporters now as an exporter he has got a mandate to uh, send the low pesticide uh, pesticide residue free rice to different countries for example if you are talking about europe they are asking send rice that is having low pesticide residues now when does farmer push pesticides when there is more pest when is there more pest when the water is stagnated and when is water stagnated when the farmer is not using it properly so our solution is addressing this particular problem as a result we are able to talk to some of the exporters saying that look if you are able to invest into a technology that is going to enable the farmer to do proper irrigation management thereby reduces water consumption thereby reduces the pesticide residues now you might be wondering what has this got to do with carbon right because one thing we also discovered Anish, if i may interrupt uh, yeah. these are exciting stuff firstly a minute because we have to move on we have all the time in the world secondly maybe can is there any other challenge we can discuss this i think this is pretty exciting what you are talking about that can be an excellent driver one is as you said the farmer doesn't appreciate your solution so you are moving elsewhere is there any other challenge that you are facing right now let's if we can focus on solutions today it will be wonderful no that is the biggest challenge and the second one is a capital investment Uh -huh. even assuming we try to convince the farmer his question is i am not in a position to pay even 1000 rupees i am sure srivats also has got same challenge other people also will be having challenge farmers are used to get things free mm -hmm. but the way i look at it is anything you give free they don't see a value so i believe they have to pay some money how much is the question right so being a small company or being a very startup kind of thing we are not in a position to invest on lot of invest lot of money and technology that can actually uh, uh, bring down the cost of this offerings right so these are two three challenges one is farmers reluctance to pay any money and second one is government policy of giving water and electricity free so there is no there is no kind of push on the farmers and third one awareness at a Uh, what do you call uh, uh, end user level okay i would not use the word end user or the person who is going to be paying that are the beneficiary level these are the three challenges we are trying to fight with thank you thank you very much malesh uh, you can stay as long as you want thank you very much for being here yeah yes uh, why don't we, why don't we work on the topic you see uh, he has mentioned one thing which we probably are all aware the fact that for the farmers the use of solutions is very challenging because he is used to many things is his use of priced solutions or uh, solutions that have a price on them is challenging because he has he is used to having things free but that again is one part of the challenge i think the bigger challenge is okay assuming even the farmer adopts it the price is going to increase right i think sashi can have a lot to say i have had the privilege of visiting his farm in uh, near chennai uh, in kuriyambakkam twice and both times he also Uh, obliged to visit us along with my uh, Chennai Climate Consortium team and gave a nice talk. So she probably has few things um, where, if assuming you do organic, if you really go circular, you do organic. I think the inputs cost, process costs are going to increase. The final end product is going to cost more. Uh, whether it is dairy that Sashi is doing, whether it is something else, rice, wheat, whatever. or meat for instance which uh, rather plant based meat rather cell based meat that um, clear meat is doing where do you see the end user market you see where do you see them firstly be it uh, sashi sashi and the, maybe sashi will be a great question to answer because they are already on the shelves i am a user of akshay kalpa um, curd almost every day i use it uh, so sashi may be in a question where do you see the consumer is it really the mass consumer is it willing to appreciate that um, the delta of 30 or 40 percent the buys for an organic product sashi a very good question uh, narsi uh, my 13 years uh, uh, in market though i don't like uh, market side very much my answer direct answer is no so at a mass market size consumer is not willing to pay for it okay so but what is the way forward okay um, the costs are higher and uh, how do we make them uh, pay so uh, the the question here is 
not everybody we, can, we cannot assume it's going to be mass market so i believe top 1 to 2% of the customers we need to really win their confidence hey you know what okay this is what is happening in the farming these are the challenges this is how your food is produced in a conventional system and uh, this is exactly how we are changing it that conversion is required when i say top 1% we more often than we mistake it is top 1% of the people who are willing to pay no top 1% of the people who are conscious most of our customers if you really look at they are not the okay upper middle class or super rich people so they are actually middle class people okay and they are very very conscious about their child's health and uh, they are, they continue to buy a conventional milk they are not fully replaced okay their milk and they take half a liter of our milk for their children so that's exactly how i see the market evolving this is a customer base we need to win this is a huge market we need to win but it's very slow and gradual uh to so, yeah. sashi just to stop you only for a moment that's a good point you made you are saying there is a customer segment which is conscious but as you yourself said it's a very small percentage one percentage for this to grow into even five percentage is a big big challenge isn't that what you are saying yes i totally uh, that's exactly what i'm trying to say nrc lot of us are making mistakes by okay saying that certain percentage of the consumer base will convert i think jio bumi will watch for it we are our customer shilpa is a great fan of jio bumi okay she buys all her staples rice everything from jio bumi so uh, there are not many people willing to pay but okay. that 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 we need to work okay the question is how do we work for example if you take us you now what we have done is last one year last one year we have taken 10000 customers from bangalore and put them in the farms go sit with the farmer understand his problem become a farmer for a day or two eat the food what they are doing understand how much money they are making okay understand their lifestyles understand the soil issues now that tribe is growing people want to know better and better this is going to be a very gradual exercise not a overnight shift uh, in my opinion so just to summarize what you said we'll come back to you the key challenge you are saying is look the positive is there is a small group who are conscious but the flip side is it's a very small group to make it sizable could be a very gradual and slow process siddharth what do you think i know you are in the very initial stages of your cell based meat now i don't know the economics of your meat compared to the conventional meat or the plant based meat but you guys surely would have thought about or interacted with your end user segments target segments what is the what is the um, feeling there like what is the uh, vibes there like are they willing to pay more firstly is it you are going to cost more by how much more or is the is the use of willing to pay more what are your sentiments here so let me give you a brief about uh, the current uh, market exposure that we have analyzed and then i will come to the price parity uh, if you speak of these strategies business strategies that all these sustainable or as sashi sir rightly pointed the methods that we have been adopting uh, for the last generations uh, we feel or my team feels that we are stuck in a sandwich position between millennials gen z and gen x uh, the thought process is totally different and uh, the strategies that we have in place right now are more convincing for the millennials but uh, the target audience is ultimately gen x so we have to understand the difference between the thought processes uh, when you speak of uh, people being connected to the idea of sustainability millennials and gen gen z gen x sorry gen x and millennials are the current generations we do understand it but we are not willing to uh, spend more for this particular thought irrespective of what would be the impact if you speak of gen uh, z they are more convinced with the sustainability model and they may uh, shell out more uh, money for good ideas and good products that is why organic foods have st started showing some bandwidth in the food market itself now these are certain strategies that we have to understand and as everyone i think everyone will agree to that we are slowly steadily shifting to that and policy makers are able to understand this shift investors like sushant and anjani are able to understand that shift 
we have to gear ourselves on those lines because yes uh, there are certain challenges when it comes to how we market our product how we showcase the problems i remember recently i was discussing with fssci regarding this specific problem how you would make the target audience understand the sustainability component as the whole g20 is promoting that uh, it became clear that i would not say government of india but uh, all the government bodies as whole are more pro to models that are more sustainable because they have realized the carbon emission impact the other related indirect impacts of these whole strategies but coming back to india or the current problem uh, the current generation is more cost sensitive and if you speak of more cost sensitive problem uh, speak of meat and comparing it with uh, other products like plant based meat so these are two different product models and we have to understand uh, what they offer uh, i don't know if the audience has read recently one of the vegan uh, influencer died because she was only 100% committed to vegan food so we have to understand there are certain checks and balances in the food system itself so we have to accept each food uh, category and uh, this is something which we discuss internally also and with various stakeholders globally we do realize that there are multiple options or we need multiple options in the ecosystem and it will take generations for these methods to get adopted and accepted by any audience irrespective of the price but still uh, if you speak of uh, plant based alternatives they will never be able to take charge of more than 30% of the plate of food if you speak of raw meat it will always remain at a 30 40% percentage if you speak of uh, lab grown or cultivated meat again 30 40% of the share in the longer run so these options have to be put in the food chain because they will have certain impact the reason we are having a discussion today is because what has been done by previous generations when it comes to making food and using the strategies either in manufacturing or processing it is impacting now and the shift that we will propose or we are uh, proposing it has a short term impact uh, or uh, it has a very long term impact and uh, it will take a very long journey to achieve so what i what i understand from what you said siddharth is look now say uh, in my case that is um, clear meat's case the product understanding itself needs a bit of efforts right the fact that uh, we are going to be once you make your meat you are going to be exactly meat right yeah so there is really no difference at least plant based meat tastes slightly different they know it's different in your case you are exactly meat so even the product knowledge product understanding awareness is going to be part of the whole issue the second thing i understand is change will come maybe there is a 30% market share uh, decades down the line you can look at but it's going to be a very very gradual process you are not looking at these consumers whatever they say the millennials millennials zillennials whatever they say in the um, surveys when it comes to putting money on the table it is not going to happen right now that's what i hear from you maybe we can go to uh, the, um, the last uh, so we have uh, shivatsa and then we have two investors why don't we finish with shivatsa the investors well for a change we will keep them last we now have the privilege to keep the meeting yeah Sure, Narsi. Yeah, great. I I I want to look at these challenges from two to three buckets, right? The challenges across uh, the length and breadth of uh, the supply chains. I'll start with market. Largely, uh, market has been addressed, and and I agree to the sentiments of everyone uh, that said, uh, especially what Shashi uh, said, uh, that it's a growing tribe. Fundamentally, markets determine how the supply chains eventually react. Right? When I say market, it could be a very market is very sensitive today to price uh, a point. A housewife who is buying um, a kilo of rice is only looking at can I get the five five rupees less on big basket as against something else. That's hard reality today. But that's about ninety percent or probably ninety five percent of consumer behavior is such today. and the, the and the small uh, uh, tribe is is growing who is ready to buy for a purpose i think that there is nothing much that we can do except the fact that we can uh, we can empower consumers to uh, think about uh, buying for a purpose right so they don't know many of them not that they don't want to uh, migrate but they, are, they they don't know many times so that i think one challenge that needs to be addressed in in one uh, sector second one that i think is not every food item on the table 
need to be carbon, uh, uh, you know, uh, low carbon, for example. Some is possible, some it is not possible. We have to be agree. We have to agree to that uh, fact. And I'm sure Sashi sir will also agree that when you eat uh, organic food, not every single uh, portion that you're eating can be organic. Practically today, price prohibition is always there. It is, it is, it is not possible to have, right? Uh, th that's the uh, uh, that's why we have to choose a very product where which carries premium, which carries uh, uh, value. For I'll talk about a little bit of experience that we had with low carbon coffee life cycle assessment that we did uh, for production of low carbon Arabica coffee, working with TechnoServe. Right, um, that's one part that I second part that I would see. Third part that I think is uh, production of low carbon coffee requires a lot of support to the entire ecosystem. You, you look at the, the production side of the coffee itself, right? Uh, for example, it, 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 uh, we, we ended up looking at life cycle assessment from multiple angles. When I say multiple angles, it was not just about knowing the farm details to crop details to uh, uh, picking uh, of, of, of the coffee, drying of coffee, fermentation of coffee, hulling of coffee, roasting, grinding, packing, etc. Et a lot of data needs to be substantiated. A lot of data needs to be captured. How does one do that today? Right, that's a fundamental challenge at the grassroots level that exists. Uh, right, I, we cannot simply say that look, it is low carbon coffee that the coffee is now uh, the coffee that is produced uh, is now emitting only 1.8 uh, kgs of carbon dioxide as against a conventional coffee per kg where it is uh, 16 kg of carbon dioxide. How do we then educate the customer? How do we uh, uh, make it easy for consumers to access this information, understand this information, verify veracity of the information? That's a third bucket that I, I want to actually uh, 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 categorize the challenge uh, in, right? Uh, uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, 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 the 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 uh, uh, whole uh, idea about uh, putting in policies framework. I, I'm not a, a big fan of of that right now because you cannot uh, uh, because there will be uh, uh, ways and means in which people will come back with very minimalistic approach to policies. Right, so you can say FSSA wants uh, traceability to be put there, but uh, the traceability is undefined. So things like that. So I, I I largely though I missed one last point that I had in my mind. I think I missed my thought process. But largely these consumer behavior. Uh, 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 not being ready to pay uh, for that, the tribe is growing definitely. I think uh, production is uh, needs to be ha uh, handled. Farmers need support, uh, uh, agronomy support. Not that they don't want to do things; they want to do uh, things correctly, but they need a lot of support. Uh, uh, third one is on the pricing. Fourth one is how do you uh, make uh, consumption of this information, veracity of the information, easy? And we must really focus on. Um, on, on uh, premium category to begin with, because it's a change in the shift or shift in the behavior of consumer. I'll pause there, uh, don't, don't want to eat into others' uh, time, but that's largely my views about it, Narsi. Oh, I'll come back to you, sir, sir, but you know, we probably have about 15 minutes. I'll make sure I end it by 12. So even though it's supposed to be 45 minutes, I take the liberty of extend, extending it by five or 10 minutes. We'll come back to you on a question, but just uh, on this question, just keep it in mind though. The traceability that you speak about and the con consumer awareness, consumer appreciation is one of the key things we are talking about. How much is this traceability and the data you are able to put on the labels or the packages? How much are they counting for? Maybe we'll come back to you. If yeah. that, if is that is that a challenge as well? You do all these things, but the consumer doesn't care. Is there a challenge as well? We'll come back to you on that. Just uh, yeah. make a note in your uh, uh, make a note in your mind. Just think about the answer. Why don't we go to Sushant? Maybe then we'll go to Anjani. Uh, so Sushant, I mean, you've been you've been looking at, as you said, the agri segment for some time. Though as a as a as a debt provider, uh, maybe debt plus equity. Uh, I don't know finance much, but yeah, I guess uh, you're more of a venture debt provider. Uh, I mean, when you guys look at these investments, obviously you look at the overall business case and how much does the consumer end of it. The consumer appreciation and the consumer market growth as a result. How much does how much does do these figure in your evaluations and what are your opinions based on that? Yeah. Thanks, Narsi. And I think very interesting to hear uh, viewpoints from others. I think uh, consumer interest uh, is of utmost uh, importance to everyone. I mean, if the business is not earning revenue uh, uh, as per expectations, right? What are we uh, even here for, uh, right? 
so consumer is on top priority and that's where i would say uh, the low carbon food and agri or organic uh, uh, right as it's very very micro in india i mean i have personally worked with some of the bigger names in the organic food industry they are very very small uh, uh, compared to the market that there okay. is right so that has to actually drive everything consumer uh, uh, interest right now i think uh, i have i think two things in mind where uh, we have to focus on that and how can we solve that i think government has to play a key role here uh, we cannot solve uh, uh, for this consumer demand because of the nature of the farming right it's intensive it's capital intensive you know it's time intensive uh, i mean land has to take a certain time to become certified uh, organic you need to invest in capex you need to invest in working capital and then ultimately the market you are selling to uh, is itself uh, small right uh, unless government brings in uh, uh, incentives and policies Uh, for example two things if they bring in cost of health and cost of environment if you uh, actually you know uh, um, make it data driven these costs if you account for then i think you can arrive at somewhere where you can say you know cost of organic food is actually uh, uh, maybe at par or even lower uh, than the uh, non organic uh, food right but government has to sort of play a key role Uh, uh, here, that's one. Uh, I mean, so to like expand the market, tax, otherwise, like a carbon tax on energy, yeah. maybe have a health yeah. tax, environment yes. tax. Go ahead. Yeah, interesting. Yes, I Go mean, ahead. so because that's when the market will expand. Otherwise, the impact, the climate impact, also we are talking about, will always remain limited because that's directly proportional, right? Uh, whatever is consumer buying. So that's one. Second is on the capital uh, side, right? Uh, on the capital side, uh, I mean, you know, I'm happy to notice that there are already green shoots. Uh, that are there uh, in this direction i personally believe that venture capital uh, in its current form is not the right capital uh, for uh, this segment because of the reasons i mentioned it's very capital intensive it's very time intensive it might take you know 7 10 12 years to really uh, uh, see the benefits so uh, and within a current 3 4 year exit 5 year exit kind of time period that the investors are looking at it really doesn't fit in so there needs to be really strategic capital uh, so green shoots are for example rbi recently launched green bonds uh, uh, in india right first ever uh, green bonds were launched so really happy to see that because when capital markets sort of pay attention and that's the scale uh, that you can you know uh, uh, get from second is uh, you know something called blended finance uh, i personally had the experience of creating blended finance products for climate smart agri especially right so that's where you know philanthropic capital has a crucial role to play wherever uh, philanthropic institutions have a focus on climate right you need to leverage that for commercial capital right not just provide grants but provide blended finance reduce the overall cost of capital uh, for the farmers for the enterprises uh, uh, you know uh, and that's where the scale also comes in right if you just provide grants it is limited if you leverage the commercial capital you really open up uh, the market right so these are you know couple of things in terms of government's uh, incentives and uh, capital of grant and commercial coming together i see potential solution where you can expand the market and bring down the uh, cost at par uh, yeah very interesting yeah so you you mentioned challenges as well as you started off on the solutions we can probably continue with the next session in fact i think maybe sashi next session uh you know you can even look at who are your investors are they aligned to the kind of investors he is talking about is it blended financing is it uh, as he said companies or investors who look at it with a patient capital maybe we can come back to you on that could be interesting to see how you guys are approaching it we have about uh, 10 minutes i'm going to give um, uh, anjali to anjali the opportunity to say his thoughts and maybe quickly um, you know um, uh, wrap it up and we can have the rest for the next session so anjali you have you, you are in an interesting position you you work both in japan and india so you would have seen the markets in both places to some extent if you are in a position to talk about both markets i'll be happy as well go ahead sure thanks narsi yeah as you know um, the advantage of going last is i get to hear uh, uh, you know everybody else uh, share their excellent thoughts so i'm a little bit lost in what everybody said thinking about that but i'll try to add to uh, the points that have been made well one you know i think based on the few learnings that we have drawn from our investments 
uh, we think that there is a there is an acceptance of price premium from uh, like Siddharth was saying, not every customer, but certain segments of customers. So for companies, that's the first step to identify and tailor their products and messaging to those customer segments. Uh, having said that, the price premium cannot be too high. Uh, customers are willing to pay a small price premium. And therefore, we think that it's important for the cost of decarbonization to be borne uh, uh, you know, to varying degrees, but by stakeholders across the value chain. Uh, which includes suppliers, workers, investors, and consumers. Uh, so, for example, you know, if you take a, a product uh, uh, which uh, where the cost of goods sold are higher because of adoption of certain practices on farm or inputs on farm to lower the carbon footprint, but at the same time, uh, the retailers can perhaps reduce their operating costs by adopting certain decarbonization practices. Uh, and as a result, the total margin that uh, the consumer needs to pay can be reduced. It cannot be eliminated, but it can be reduced. So in general, we feel that the uh, there is an opportunity to look at the cost of how it can be distributed across the value chain and not just the premium that a consumer needs to pay. Uh, the second point is, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, based on uh, some of our uh, uh, companies, uh, we think the messaging or the branding uh, needs to be balanced between the decarbonization or climate change impact and the core uh, uh, you know, qualities that a consumer is looking for from a product. So if you are, for example, selling a consumer a milk or like say meat in case of uh, clear meat, uh, the consumer's first uh, you know, uh, goal is to buy product which is uh, which tastes great, uh, which is nutritious uh, and uh, cost competitive. And then they think about, okay, climate change or how is this product is climate friendly. So making sure that the entire value proposition is balanced in the messaging uh, is also important. Uh, and the last thing uh, you know I would say is also that uh, it goes back to, I think, Srivatsa's point is that these claims have to be uh, meaningful and easily understood. So more and more, if you are sticking labels like the product is environmental friendly or it is greener, you know, these, if anything, actually are counterproductive uh, and they dilute the whole uh, value proposition of uh, low carbon products. Uh, and therefore having quantitative measures, uh, relative uh, CO2 performance of a product compared to uh, other brands in the market and substantiated by an independent third party. These are some of the things that can perhaps make it easier for consumers to make uh, purchasing decisions. Thanks. Got it. Just to um, uh, last uh, minute of your time, Anjali, but have you seen any major difference between uh, Japan and India, just in case you have uh, been exposed to the Japanese markets as well? Well, if anything, I would say the whole discussion is more advanced in India than in Japan. Uh, you know, of course, there are other countries, uh, you know, it's there, it's there, which are further ahead, I would say, like in Europe or perhaps North America. Uh, but uh, I think India, the conversation is, uh, you know, it, it has a lot of energy. Oh, yeah, I, I, that's my personal view. Yeah. Very interesting. Guys, we have uh, maybe just a couple of minutes to wrap up. So, um, we can perhaps continue. I think I shot some questions to see what's uh, maybe Sashi has a few things. I'm sure each of you has, and some of you had already started suggesting solutions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap it up here. I promise that I will pull all you guys um, uh, back to the screen maybe in a couple of weeks, but by then I would have done my homework. I would have uh, you know, given you guys some homework to finish as well based on what you guys said. That can be far more exciting. We can probably have it for an hour when we can have uh, inputs from each of you guys. And if uh, if time permits, we can even have a third, a third discussion. This is really exciting because I think we had really good uh, insights on the key challenges. As I said, some of you guys have already started suggesting solutions, but as I can see, uh, the key one thing we all agree is the, the end user market currently is, the conscious end user market currently is small. There's no question about it. Whatever the surveys say, when it comes to putting money on the table, the conscious consumer market willing to pay that price premium is small. 
and the growth is gradual. Whatever you are talking about, whether you are talking about rice that Malesh grows or meat that Siddharth grows or um, Sashi, the um, dairy that Sashi produces. I think we all agreed on that. It's a very small market right now. The growth is gradual. Challenges seem to be across the value chain, right from what I think Malay said that, you know, consciousness at the upstream level with the farmers, the policymakers still need to get their entire gear in place. They are thinking about it, they are aware of it, but everything is not in place. And as, uh, you know, some of you guys mentioned, even at the, as uh, uh, mentioned, even at the consumer level, well, data perhaps is available to some extent, but how much do consumers digest it and care? These are all questions that we still have. From at a solutions level, as I said, this is for another session, but we already had people like Sushant starting off on such and such as, look, um, blended finance could be one of them, right? I mean, that could be one way to overcome that. Malaysia also already started such, some interesting solutions, how we can make the consumer, uh, not the consumer, more the farmer, realize uh, the importance of certain practices. And I think it's been, it, it's been a wonderful session. I need really... Go back to the whole thing. I'm glad we have recorded it. We'll be sharing it. We'll be publishing this also so you can all look at what you guys said and what others said. It's it's a, it's an engrossing topic. And as one of you guys mentioned, if we're able to do justice for the next two sessions and bring it to some level, now that it's all available in public, we can even publish um, inputs from you guys as a blog post connected to the video. Hopefully it will all lead to somewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shivatsa. Thank you, Sashi, Siddharth, Sushant, Anjani, and Malesh. Thank you very much for being here. I'll catch up with each of you separately. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank Good talk. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.